Hello, I'm Elizabeth Thomas, the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the Zuckerman Museum of Art at Kennesaw State University, and this is the workshop Exploring Space, Making Form, Three Artists at the ZMA. I wish you could be on campus to experience the Summer Arts Intensive in person with other young people your age, but since that can't happen at the moment, we want to virtually share with you some of the art we have on display in our galleries. In particular, this workshop is about the work of three artists whose three-dimensional works occupy real space. At times in this video, you'll be asked questions followed by pauses to give you time to reflect on what is being asked. If you ever want more time to reflect than what is given, please pause your video or rewind to hear any parts over again. Following this presentation, I encourage you to try some exercises to create sculptural forms of your own. Some resources and suggested activities are shared in a PDF you can find underneath the link to this video. If you want to learn more about the College of the Arts, please fill out the form also found below this video and sign up for our email list located on the bottom left of our website. Our museum is made up of three main exhibition spaces. Upon entering the building through the main entrance and ascending to the second floor via the elevator or stairs, you come into the Ruth Zuckerman Pavilion. This space is where we have a permanent exhibition of the work of Ruth Zuckerman. I'll share a lot with you about the life of Mrs. Zuckerman. She was a sculptor in this area for many years. She worked primarily in stone and cast metals. You'll see a number of her works in this segment. We also have the East Galleries, which currently feature a group exhibition of abstract work by artists of African descent titled Unbound, and the Morton Gallery, which features Looming Chaos, a solo show of work by the artist Zephora Camille Thompson. I will share work from Ms. Thompson out of Looming Chaos and the artist Krista Clark from Unbound. These three women have each explored form in their own unique ways. Over the next half hour, we'll look at their art, watch some footage of Clark and Thompson speaking about their work, and even hear from a curator. Form, an element of art. It describes an object that is three-dimensional and encloses volume, the physical characteristics of an object. All of these works are sculptural forms. In the case of Zuckerman, she created discrete sculptures. The pieces she created were intended to live on their own as independent objects. She worked from 1953 to 1993 and died in 1996. She was of the modernist era. Her mature style conveys human familial relationships in an idealized or utopic way. But we also see variation in the things she chose to represent, her forays into different sculpting techniques, and different processes. In fact, she found inspiration in some rather mundane things, like the vegetable fennel or the eating of an apple. This indicates that she was not oblivious to the ongoing 20th century argument in art over the legitimacy of appropriating non-artistic forms for the sake of art. Let's take a look now at a sampling of her art while I tell you about her life. Ruth Victor was born and raised in New York City. Her father was an accomplished self-taught painter and her mother was an actor in the Yiddish theater and a published poet. She learned to play piano and violin with skill and sensitivity. Ruth attributed the discipline of daily music practice to her success in dedicating time each day to her art making later in life. By the time Ruth graduated from high school, the United States was engaged in World War II. Two years later, she joined the Women's Division of the United States Marine Corps, where she met Bernard Zuckerman, a young Army lieutenant. They arranged mutual leaves to see each other over the course of several months and married after only four dates. Their wartime romance lasted 50 years. After their time in the service, Ruth Victor Zuckerman and her husband started their civilian lives together in New York. They had two daughters, Rowan and Laura. In 1961, when the girls were both in school, Ruth used her GI Bill to enroll in the School of Visual Arts. She continued her studies at several other renowned art schools and embarked on a 10-year odyssey of self-discovery. She literally picked up wood scraps from trash barrels as well as all of the instructions she could absorb. By 1966, the Zuckerman's apartment was crowded with her art with little space to work, and so she rented a huge fourth floor walk-up manufacturing loft in Greenwich Village to enable carving large stones. She scavenged stone from old buildings being torn down and replaced by skyscrapers in the building boom of that decade. Fine chunks of neoclassical columns and pediments, fragments, whose broken surfaces suggested new forms. She also began to show her work in New York and New Jersey, 
and by 1968 had received several favorable reviews. At the start of her career, she sketched her ideas before carving. Soon, her devotion to the Thai direct method of carving precluded preliminary sketches. In later work, she returned to drawing when she needed to refine the intersecting geometric planes and organic shapes of maquettes for large abstract works. She obtained interesting stones from all over the world and carved stone intuitively. Ruth spoke of her respect for stone, saying, not until the stone and I achieve a rapport and it tells me what it wishes to become do I lift the chisel to rid it of its excesses. Once this occurs, I do not in any way mark, revise, or impose my will upon the initial concept, but rather allow the sculpture to emerge. I merely assist. In the summer of 1970, shortly before moving permanently to Atlanta, Georgia, Ruth traveled to the Instituto Alland in Mexico for a class in bronze casting, introducing her to the second primary medium in her practice. Although it wasn't until the following year, at the age of 48, that Ruth Zuckerman found her true creative home in Pietra Santa in the Tuscan region of Italy. Pietra Santa is an ancient hill town in the mountains near Carrara, where huge quarries have supplied marble to builders and sculptors since the Roman Empire. In the summer of 1971 and every subsequent year until 1993, she rented studio space in the sprawling workshops of the Artigiani, the skilled artisans who have passed on their knowledge of carving and casting since the Renaissance. She boarded at a simple pensione, arose each morning to the hammering of pneumatic drills, and walked to her studio to work. Each year, for 22 years, when her time in Italy was over, Ruth shipped home, finished sculptures, and roughly blocked out works ready for completion in her Atlanta studio. She always returned to home with her collection of stones and would work all day, just as she did in Italy. Pietra Santa thus remained at the core of her creative being, even when she was not there. It was the one place she could be totally free to focus all her energy on the fulfillment of her vision. She stored up Pietra Santa's spiritual nourishment to sustain her art until she returned each year. By the late 1970s, she had developed her mature style, stylizations of the human figure formed from a single stone that seemed to flow from its grain. These works conveyed universal themes of family, love, and protection. Stone is perhaps the oldest and most enduring art material. Each stone carries the history of our planet within its substance. This union of the organic with the geometric, figuration with abstraction, and tender human expression and hard stone are the basic principles of Ruth Zuckerman's sculpture. Zuckerman understood and respected the eternal nature of the materials she chose and the eternal and everlasting statements in her work. Following Ruth Zuckerman's death in 1996, the KSU Art Galleries, under the leadership of Roberta Griffin, put together a retrospective of her life's work. The majority of this story is taken from Ms. Griffin's essay published in conjunction with that exhibition, The Spirit in the Stone. In 1999, Bernard Zuckerman made a major gift to our university by donating 125 pieces of his late wife's art. When the Bernard A. Zuckerman Museum opened in 2014, it was made possible due to the very generous funding of Mr. Zuckerman and his desire to forever share Ruth's work with the people of our community. Our museum continues to expand upon the legacy from which we originated. The exhibition schedule brings numerous new shows to our campus every year. The work of the other two artists we'll look at next are on display thanks to our forward-thinking former curators, Dr. Teresa Bramlett-Reeves and Sarah Higgins, and the partnership they established with Dr. Marita Poole, the director of the Clark Atlanta University Art Museum. They, along with individuals at the Philadelphia Academy of Fine Arts, secured grant funding and established a fellowship to support two young emerging curators of color for two years and guide them in the development of a major museum show. Looming Chaos and Unbound are the results of that fellowship and the hard work and creativity of those involved, most of all that of the fellows themselves, T.K. Smith and Nzinga Simmons. Let's turn now to the vision of Nzinga Simmons. Nzinga developed Unbound, a group show of artists of African descent working from the 1950s to the present day who specifically have chosen to work abstractly. She traces an arc, starting with those born in the earlier part of the 20th century, who dealt with pressure to not pursue abstraction and instead make figurative art to visually depict a positive and wholesome image of African Americans. Many felt this was vital in the fight for civil rights. 
Not that there's anything wrong with figurative art, but why should any artist feel obligated to make anything other than the kind of art that suits them? She carries us through the show to contemporary artists who create abstract art which articulates their own artistic vision. From Unbound, we're going to examine the site-specific installation work by Krista Clark titled Annotations of Sheltered. This work is situated in the final quadrant of the show. Hers is one of the last artworks you experience before exiting through the same door you entered. The final block of wall text for the visitor is to the left of her piece. Krista Clark is an Atlanta-based artist originally raised in Vermont who completed her undergraduate art degree at Georgia State and her MFA in New York. Let's listen to Krista's comments from our panel discussion on March 4th, 2020, as she speaks about how her work has changed over time. In the video clips from this panel, you'll see seated from left to right in Zynga Simmons, Krista Clark, Zephora Camille Thompson, and TK Smith. Installation, an art form that comprises visual elements in any medium and the space they inhabit. An often temporary and ephemeral art form that draws on architecture, decoration, assemblage, the practice of the object, and the ready-made. Installations challenge the concept of the artwork as a unique and sacred object. The practice is derived from the modern inclination to break down barriers between different fields of activity. An installation can also be a calculated way of establishing a work's form. What do you notice when you look at this artwork? What things are recognizable to you? Now is one of the times when you will have a few moments to reflect on what you're seeing. Consider the various objects. Think about or describe to yourself how they are arranged and what they might indicate or imply in terms of a symbolic meaning. What does it mean um, when I take on that role? Or what does it mean when I take on that role of 
this architectural space and for me to um, to craft that space. Does uh, that does that change that? Does that change that in any way, in terms of that, that space of power? Uh, but ultimately, I think about my um, self as, as an explorer. Ready-made, a term coined by Marcel Duchamp in the second decade of the 20th century. Its use has now been extended to all approaches based on using an ordinary material an image, an object, or even an idea, with its ordinary qualities, its everyday trivialness. A desacralizing gesture, even if it is somewhat weakened by now. Um, are about these transitional, um, transitional materials, but then also transitional spaces, um, and being in conversation um, with a type of minimalist aesthetic, um, but for me, it is about disrupting that um, that space. Um, and so, a lot of the gestures that I make in the work, um, I'm thinking about um, how can I kind of interrupt that order of minimalism. Um, and then, it is also ultimately about how we dwell in space. Um, and so, for me. Something that's always been also, in addition to drawing, another underlying aspect of the work um, that I, it's really coming back to is about um, really about shelter, and that's something that was there early on in my when I was just working primarily with drawings, um, or more so with works on paper, um, and again veered away from that. But that's um, and really especially with this show, um, really thinking about. Um, that, that space of home and that space of, but even beyond that, just um, what is the structure of shelters and the importance of that. What does sheltered mean to you? A slab of concrete tilted on a wall inside of a tent also hanging from the wall with a light inside whose cord trails from a far off source on high, wood and windows leaning out toward the viewer held in place by a bungee cord. Do these annotations have a meaning and a purpose to you? Krista Clark and the final artist we're going to look at today, Zephora Camille Thompson, are both artists who, like Ruth Zuckerman, utilize the element of space in the construction of their art. Clark worked on paper for a long time, but in more recent years shifted to installations. She uses the non-traditional materials she purchases or finds and puts them together in interesting, unexpected ways. Thompson is a weaver or fiber artist, a ceramicist, and a sculptor. She incorporates a wide variety of found objects in her work, our museum commissioned five new works for the Looming Chaos exhibition. For those pieces, she created five installation works. Marcel Duchamp, who launched the Dada movement in 1916, famously said he was interested in ideas, not merely visual products. He coined the term ready-made to describe what he presented as art, repurposed, factory-made, functional products, which he titled with phrases related to the product's use. These works pushed viewers to consider the objects in a new light. We are a century beyond Duchamp's disruption of the idea of an artist as a skilled creator of the handmade. We commonly see use of ready-mades in contemporary art. When we do, we can immediately go to an analysis that reads the repurposed item as a signifier of an idea. I ask that you analyze Krista Clark's installation, Annotations of Sheltered, in such a framework. Let's look now at Zephora Camille Thompson's weavings, assemblages, and installations in Looming Chaos, curated by T.K. Smith, and hear her and T.K. talk about the scope of her artistic practice. I'm from North Carolina, and my family has, has like, passed land down through, uh, through the family um, that my great-grandfather first purchased a while ago. He's like the first black landowner um, in the county that I'm from. Um, and so kind of landscape and land in general to hold on to it, preserve it, and tend to it, care for it. What does that mean? You know, how does that get passed on through generations? Um, 
it, that's been something that I've always had to consider and wanted to consider and wanted to be very interested and involved in. Um, and so from early on, it kind of started there. And then I think like just being very moved by places. And um, I love traveling, I love experiencing new places. I love the power of a place um, in an environment to really transport you and to make you feel like, wait a minute, on, where am I again? You know, um, and to, the, also I'm really intrigued by like how a particular place can have you almost thinking that you are an entirely, like it will connect to a memory from somewhere else. Um, it feels very familiar even though you've never been there before. I love that feeling. Um, and I feel that a lot. I don't know when I'm traveling, I'm like, I've been here before. Not, <laughs> but I love that my work. Like I think about those moments, and I think about how do I create that in work? How do I create that feeling or that kind of nostalgia for these places that do that or that create that? Um, and how do I make that physical, visual, actual, tangible thing? Or how do I try? Because I feel like I don't come close, right? Um, but how do I explore all of that through? These, all these different materials. Um, I do have a lot of like vision boards, as silly as that sounds, um, where I will look at like detailed images of like hardened lava or like you know detailed images of all these different landscapes. And what I'll do is I'll like compare and contrast like different. I really like how that image you know has like this dark um, you know, really rugged texture, and how do I combine that with something that's very delicate and atmospheric and really cloudy and foggy and delicate, you know? And so it's like combining all these things that really don't go together, and how do I look at these different images of inspiration and then draw from my own memories to bring it all together in a work. The language of abstraction was seriously there all along. Mm -hmm. um, and I fought it a lot in early on. Assemblage. The sculptor's equivalent of collage in three dimensions. The goal is to juxtapose two or more materials or objects, often found objects, thereby creating a unique object that combines the qualities of its several components. The elements of an assemblage can be left as is, transformed, painted, etc. A totem is, uh, is more than just an object, but it is an object that symbolizes or signals something else. And it's a word we've been using a lot to describe the work and people's experience with some of the objects and materials that you use. Because as you're going through the gallery, and even with Christian's work, as you're experiencing it, you're experiencing signals that are being that are being communicated. I still feel like this is that are being communicated. I may just have a big voice. Are you drawing the eye? But um, the, the symbols that you that you don't know that you recognize that you recognize immediately. There's a lot of hair in Zephora's work. There's images and, and cassette tape and rubber and uh, you know there's all of these different materials that symbol and signal different things. Which kind of speaks to how you were just saying you experience materials that become intimate. I think when people are looking at your work and they take the time and spend time with the work and begin to tease out the materials that they're composed of, they'll start to have multiple intimate moments with why do these barrettes, why use those? Why do they make me feel this way? You know, you someone will see those barrettes and not know what they are and not have an emotional connection to them. But somebody will see those barrettes and have a whole memory smell, you know, like all these blue magic, all these things that will come back to you. And so um, the use of materials are extremely important, I think, when experiencing the work. Yeah. And looking at those things that help and I take all the techniques that I know about in textiles and in ceramics and explore sculpture, explore insulation, um, to really create these types of environments that explore the unknown, um, explore uh, landscapes, um, not only the type of landscapes that are physical and natural that we see every day around it, um, definitely those, um, but also uh, what are other types of landscapes, um, looking at the cosmic landscapes, looking at the psychic landscapes, looking at all these other landscapes, landscapes of the mind, right, and, the, um, 
And so like really exploring uh, the unknown through these different types of landscapes and through these different um, places or spaces, whether imagined or real or some sort of hybrid between the two. Like the series of actions that I'm going to uh, like strategically create, and it's going to be the set of of things, whether it be repetition, loss, and bloom, or whether it be um, you know dying and knowing there's all this alchemy and things that happen on their own that I have to like respond to. Um, kind of just working with all of that and being able to respond to all of that in real time and be okay and be able to let go and still make something of it without just, you know, being like hella good and sort of trash. You have now seen most of the works in the Looming Chaos show. Let's pause before we get to the close and the final installation. I'd like for you to take a moment to analyze Thompson's fourth installation, Varus, Wands. What do you immediately recognize here? What are the ready-mades, the found objects, the assembled things? How has Thompson used those things in combination with the weaving she created on the loom? And what do you notice about the elements of art? Consider how the colors, textures, lines, shape, and use of space play into her overall expression and form. which she uses throughout all of her works, but she has never created a work specifically to represent the Ouroboros. And so in the sketches, we talk about this huge ceramic snake that would be the center of this, and then all of these interwoven pieces around it. And so that, in sound, you can imagine who knows what that looks like, depending on your mind, what that looks like. I didn't know what this would look like in its completed form. But as she sent more sketches and we had more conversations, she talked about all of these different snakes in different positions meeting at this point of eternal return, meeting at this cyclical point where everything is recycled, everything is renewed. And so this piece kind of brings into this space, the ceramic part of her practice too. The best way to describe it is just that it is her interpretation of the symbol of the world. Ouroboros. The Ouroboros is an ancient symbol depicting a serpent or dragon eating its own tail. It originated in ancient Egypt and is an emblem of wholeness or infinity. In my practice, I'm kind of investigating that. Um, the power of materials, the power that an object or a thing has to tell a story, to tell a history. Um, most always has like some sort of memory in the object itself or how that object was passed throughout history or how that object came into existence or came into being or how it was created and so for me that's always been very fascinating and that's something that I've embraced in my practice and um, kind of use that to my advantage with the found objects that I incorporate into the work and um, I think there's this amassing, this, this need to amass and collect and bring together things that normally don't exist together or exist in conversation um, with each other and that's kind of what I incorporate into the work pretty heavily. Well this completes our workshop Exploring Space, Making Form, Three Artists at the ZMA. I hope you've enjoyed the program. 
If you'd like to see any of these works for yourself, please check out our website for information about our phased reopening this summer. Procedures for visiting will be announced as soon as they are determined. Unbound and Looming Chaos will hang until July 26. After that time, we'll be closed for installation until August 29th when we open our fall exhibitions. The work of Ruth Zuckerman will always be on display. See the next slide for more resources, and I wish you a safe and productive summer. So long!